being said, lots of us who are experts in this area still find ourselves victim of this exhaustion mode. It's just because sometimes we don't have a choice. The real world is really puts a lot of pressure on us and makes us continue to go even when we know we need to relax. So is stress inevitable? What can we do about it? Well, what's really important to understand is stress is not something that's out there. Stress is something that's only in our head. There's no actual experience that by definition is a stressful experience. Now that may sound very peculiar to you because we just talked about things like stressful experiences in the semester. But what's really important to understand is stress is not anything you can touch. Stress is how you think about a situation. And some people think about situations very differently. And what we find is what makes stress happen to us in our body, what causes this inflammation could definitely be overstimulation. If we're overstimulated and not giving ourselves enough rest, that could cause stress. But there's no one situation that's necessarily going to cause that. It's how we cognitively appraise our situations that matter. And so we have to talk about two different types of appraisals, the, first, the primary appraisal and the secondary appraisal. The primary appraisal is whether you appraise something as being threatening or non-threatening. And since the idea of your camping, you hear that rustling in those trees, do you think it's a threat or do you think it's just a bunny rabbit or a raccoon or something pretty benign? If you think right away when you hear the snapping of twigs that it's a bear, you're, much, you're going to have a much heightened stress response than if you thought it was a bunny rabbit. Thinking about something as threatening versus not threatening is going to change how you respond in a physiological way. We also know when it comes to the secondary appraisal, whether you think about something as threatening or non-threatening, can you control it or is it non-controllable? This kind of goes back to attributions, which we were talking about in Social Psychology Unit 12. And so can you control this or can you not? So let's think about three scenarios that have the potential to be stressful, but may not necessarily be stressful. Let's think about the idea that you have an upcoming midterm test. Is that stressing you out or is it not? Let's think about the fact that you have to go shopping, but you're worried the malls are going to be crowded. Now I wrote this before COVID-19, so I was thinking about just general Christmas time crowded shopping centers. We can also think about COVID-19 crowds and how you don't want to be contaminated in the shopping mall. And as a third example, let's say you notice a new mole on your arm and you're worried that perhaps the mole could be cancerous. So these are three different scenarios that could lead to stress, but are not necessarily going to be stressful. Let's dive into them using the primary and secondary appraisals. So first up, let's think about the test. We have an upcoming test. And what happens, the difference between stress and anxiety is anxiety is always looking for a fear that doesn't exist. And so if you're using your anxiety voice, you're gonna be saying, what if this happens? What if I fail? What if this, what if I drop out of school? What if people get mad at me? That's the anxiety voice. And when you have that anxiety, it's going to increase your chances of stress. And we can see this anxiety play out in both the primary and secondary appraisals. So for the primary appraisal, you might view the test as threatening. You might say, I'm going to fail the test. The test is not going to be good. I'm not gonna perform my best. This test is a threat. But that's not necessary. You might also view the test as non-threatening. You might say something like, the test is gonna be okay. It might not be my strongest, but it'll be all right. And so you might view the test as non-threatening. Now, if you view the test as threatening, you might go on from the primary appraisal to the secondary appraisal, and you might say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. This test is a threat and it's an uncontrollable threat. I'm going to fail it, and there's no way I can learn this material in time. See, if you have the threatening primary appraisal and the uncontrollable secondary appraisal, that combination is setting you up to have the most stressful response. You view this as a major issue. Versus even if we have a threatening primary appraisal, if we go on to have a controlling secondary appraisal, I'm going to fail this test, but I can improve and learn, it'll be okay, then at least you feel there's something in your control and you're gonna study, it could put you in resistance mode, it could cause some problems, but not as many as if you view this as uncontrollable. Uncontrollable, you're gonna spiral out and probably have a panic attack. Versus controllable, you're going to try and focus on something realistic that you can improve on. So there's lots of different options to view about this upcoming test. We don't have to have a threatening and uncontrollable appraisal. We can rewire our brain to think about this differently. Now let's use the second example. Let's say the shopping mall is crowded. We don't like crowds. We don't want to deal with the crowds. So again, if you were that anxious person saying, what if, what if the mall's crowded? What if I can't get away from people? What if this, what if that? So yeah, the mall being crowded could lead you down a stressful pathway. 
and you could view this as threatening, like people are in the way. I'm going to get there and there's going to be too many crowds and it's going to be a problem. You can view the crowdedness as a threat or you can view the crowdedness as not a threat. You could say, okay, the mall's going to be busy, but I can manage it. I can manage crowds. I can be patient. I can keep my distance. It can be okay. Now, if you have that threatening primary appraisal, then we also have to think about the secondary appraisal. Do you view this threat as controllable or uncontrollable? And you may through view it as uncontrollable. People are in my way and I can't control others. And no matter what happens, I'm gonna to get to the mall and people are gonna invade my personal space and they're gonna be irritating and there's nothing I can do about it. I have to go to the mall to get X, Y, Z and it's going to be a problem. That is gonna make you a lot more stressed out. But you could also view this threat as controllable. You could say, okay, I don't like the crowds, but what happens if I go as soon as the mall opens on a weekday? Or what happens if I go after supper right before the mall closes? Maybe it won't be that crowded. And so now you're thinking, okay, I don't like the crowds. The crowds is a threat to me, but I can control it by going really early or really late in the day, and it won't be as bad. So there's, there's lots of different ways we could control it. You might come up with a strategy or which door you're going to park at or, or which stores you're going to go to in what order. Um, but at least this controllable nature of your secondary appraisal allows you to feel more at ease, make you feel like you can manage this experience a little bit better. Now let's use our third one just to really bring home this point. Let's imagine you see a mole that's brand new to you and you think, okay, there's this new mole on my arm. What is happening here? You may view this as threatening. You say, oh, okay, this new mole must be dangerous. Alert, alert, alert. It's going to be a health problem. It's probably a melanoma. Oh my goodness. Or you might view the new mole in your arm as not a problem. You're like, oh, I get moles all the time. This one's circular. It's similar color. It's probably okay. So a lot of people see moles on their arms or little bumps or whatever and they say, oh, this is normal. Some of us, if you are experiencing illness anxiety disorder, you may notice every little new change in your body and say, oh my goodness, this is something I should be scared of. So if you are very threatened by this new change or this new mole on your arm, you can go on again to view this as controllable or uncontrollable. Of course, if we view this as uncontrollable, you're going to say, the mole on my arm is dangerous. It must be cancer. There must be nothing that I can do about it. It's too late for me. And you feel like your life is over. That is going to cause an immense amount of stress. In, in comparison, you could view this as, okay, this mole looks suspicious. I need to go get this checked out. And if I get it checked out right now, early treatment can work. And then you feel, okay, this is still a lot of stress. Cancer would still be very stressful, but early treatment can really help. And I've detected this very early. See how that's a bit more manageable. And so this is the idea that if you are that anxious person, you could really spiral out and view things as much more threatening and uncontrollable, but that you don't have to think that way. We can change our pathways and think about things in more non-threatening and controllable ways. Now, what we've actually found is some people are just more prone to think about our primary and secondary appraisals in a certain way. There are some people out there that are just hardwired towards optimism and they think, I'll get through this. These are the sunshiny people, the Pollyannas, the people with rose colored sunglasses on the world. And they just feel like everything is going to be okay. But not all of us are those people. Some of us are very anxious. And if you are anxious, you tend to have this little voice in your head, which hopefully is familiar to you now, the what ifs. What if I make this person mad? What if I do this wrong? What if this big thing happens to me? And then what if that big thing happens to me? And we constantly play our lives out like that, preoccupied with the what ifs. Some of us are not so much at risk for anxiety, but more so depression. And what happens when a person's really at risk for depression, they think, I can't do it. I can't control it. I can't do it. They may have a more externalizing attribution as mentioned in unit 12. So they just feel like things are beyond their control. They're not good enough. They're not going to change. They can't have control on stuff. And this is the idea that they're just down on their luck and there's nothing they can do that's going to change the life circumstance. They might feel like a failure. Then we have the perfectionists and a lot of us tend to think perfectionists and being perfect is good, but it's really not. Perfectionists are the people that say I should or I must. I should take care of this person. I should be the caregiver. I should sign up for this committee. I must do this. I have to get my homework done. I have to do this. And you're trying to do too much. It's good to be ambitious, but it's not good to be overly ambitious and overly subscribe yourself to too many obligations. And that's where I find a lot of us are in the academic world. We want to do everything, but we can't do it all. And we can't do it all amazingly. We're going to have setbacks. We're going to have things that don't play out as good as we wanted to. 
Then we have the other side. Then we have people not so much blaming themselves, but blaming others. Some people with a more externalizing or self-protecting attribution style, as talked about in last unit, they may have a hostile appraisal style, in which case they say it's all their fault. It's all their fault. I'm mad at people at the mall and it's all their fault. I can't do anything to control it, but I'm not down in the dumps about me. It's all their fault. And so this hotel attribution or this time bomb sort of mechanism where they're just a short fuse ready to explode onto others. And then finally, there's the impulsive person who's just like, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. I don't even want to think about it. I want to put my head in the sand. I want to get drunk and not have to think about this. And so that's the impulsive person who just wants to flee a situation. They're using the flight response to flee their obligations and flee their threats rather than face them head on. So if you find yourself in one of these patterns, what can we do about it? How can we help? If you are just hardwired and you feel you'll always be the depressive person or the perfectionist or the anxious or the impulsive person, what can we do about it? Well, the good news is through the interaction model of health psychology, we have learned we can stop this pathway to stress and illness. You see right here, we're talking about the objective events that are capable of producing stress, let's say a test or a crowded shopping mall or a global pandemic. And then there's the way we cognitively appraise it. Do we think it's a threat? Do we think it's controllable? Even if you think it's an uncontrollable threat, like many of us did at the start of the pandemic, you can use coping strategies. So even if you are that more anxious, depressive, impulsive, hostile person, you can use coping strategies as the stopgap. So how you respond to your appraisals and what you do after you make a threatening and uncontrollable appraisal can change like a railroad track switching directions if you experience physical arousal and if that physical arousal and stress leads to illness. So now we have to talk about coping strategies.